it all starts in Genesis chapter 1. So let's go ahead and read through this here. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Wow. A lot of stuff going on right there. <laughs> um, so let's look at the word firmament. Strong's number 7549, it's the word rakia. We see that it's an expanse, that it is solid. It is beaten out, when you see in the book of Job. It is a solid structure, uh, some say as of ice. Uh, a, support, a, port, a support base, we see that it's uh, holding up God's throne. Uh, so it is regarded by the Hebrews as solid, supporting the waters above in the verses that you see there in the Browns Driver Briggs Concordance. When you look at Job 37:18, you see in multiple English translations a variety of ways of describing this thing, but all essentially saying the same thing. This is a hard structure, a, a mirror cast of bronze, uh, a bronze mirror, a cast metal mirror, molten mirror, molten looking glass in the King James. This is a hard structure up there. Uh, when we look at the sky in Amos chapter 9, Verse 6 it talks about a vaulted dome. It's a different word used there, aguda, if, uh, aguda, if I'm pronouncing that right, a structure fitted together. But we see in Ezekiel that this structure, this firm structure, uh, there was a likeness of the throne on top of it. We see likewise in Isaiah 66, 1, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. There's something firm up there upon which his throne is sitting. We see in Genesis 1.8, he called the firmament, the rakia, the beaten down metallic structure, heaven, shemaim. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. And he stretches out the heavens, the shemaim, as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Now, in the context of Isaiah's time, tent, this is what you might consider like a Bedouin tent structure. Uh, probably more like something like this, a yurt which is found throughout multiple cultures in the ancient world. Or even today, we might look at it as something like this, a dome tent. Regardless of which idea of a tent you look at, this is what they're saying, that the heavens are stretched out like a tent. So we have the word like or as being a metaphor, right? But tents are always stretched out over a flat surface. Interesting. So we continue. What's placed inside the tent? Genesis 1 beginning in verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good in the evening and the morning were the third day how did the dry land appear Genesis just says the dry land appeared but when we go through the uh, Old Testament texts of the prophets we see a more definition as to how that happened Job actually predates Genesis Job was written before Genesis in Job 38 uh, he talks about the laying of foundations the earth was laid out with foundations <coughs> We see that when that was happening in verse 7, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Please note, the sons of God in this context are angels, not the sons of Seth. Keep that in mind as we progress into Genesis chapter 6, because this is the understanding we need to have of the phrase, the sons of God. Uh, we see in 1 Samuel 2, 8, that the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. The world's sitting on pillars. The foundations were discovered. We got pillars and foundations. It's all through the, uh, the uh, Old Testament. Psalm 102.25, of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth. Proverbs 8.27, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, the dry land appeared out of the face of the deep in Genesis. So we get more detail here from these various authors, and there are others. I just didn't have the ability to fit them all on one slide right here. But these are really good to get us started. 
when we see that the dry land appeared as a result of Yahuwah inscribing a circle on the face of the deep, look up the Hebrew word for inscribe, we see that the Hebrew word is chakak, or kalkak, or however you pronounce it, I'm not sure. But basically it means to engrave or to carve something into something else, as if chiseling into like the, the stone for like the Ten Commandments. Please note, you cannot carve a ball into stone. However, you can inscribe a circle into stone, which is what the text says. The word circle is the word chug, which means circle. When we continue to look at this, we see that Isaiah is one of the last authors to write in this regard. A lot of people, when they're describing the earth, want to go to Isaiah 40.22, but you have to realize Isaiah is building upon all the people who had written before him, like Job and like David and like Solomon and like Moses. So when we get to Isaiah 40.22, which is a verse I have used myself to describe the earth, uh, it says, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Well, I took Hebrew 101 twice, so that should give you an indication of my aptitude for learning Hebrew. Uh, and some may say I don't even have that great a handle on English. Whatever the case may be, uh, language 101, words mean things. <laughs> and what's interesting about this, especially if you're a King James only type, um, Isaiah knew the difference between ball and a circle. In Isaiah 22:18, he talks about a ball. The Hebrew word used there is dur, ball. He chose a different word when he described the earth and staying consistent with the other authors who came before him in that regard. So Isaiah clearly knew the difference. The King James translators knew the difference. Now the question is, do we know the difference? Google helps you. If you want to Google ball or Google circle, you might get images such as this. So some say when God looked down on the earth, he saw a circle. Well, if he's looking down from the north, you don't get a circle. The only time you get a circle is if you're either sitting on the sun or directly in between the sun and the earth. If you're looking from any other direction, you get something like that when you're looking down. So I'm just going to put this out there for consideration. I'm not telling you what I believe. I am just putting this out there for consideration. This is a ball. This is a circle. Take with it whatever you want. Here's what really got me messed up in all this. Why am I even talking about this stuff? Because I believe as all you guys indicated, that we should take the Bible literally. Well, the problem is when I started to do that with regard to this particular subject, I got myself in a lot of trouble. And some of you know what I'm talking about if you've been following my YouTube channel and Facebook page. This one really got to me, though, is when we get to the fourth day, and he talks about the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. And it says in three places that he put them in the firmament. Now, I used to teach the same thing that is taught by Kent Hoven and Carl Baugh and others, that the firmament was a canopy, an ice canopy that surrounded the earth. And it's a, good, it's a great theory. And that, you know, so the theory goes, something impacted it probably, and the firmament uh, disintegrated. The windows of heaven, as it were, opened up, and the canopy disintegrated over a period of 40 days and 40 nights, and it rained down on the earth. Great theory, pretty awesome. There's a couple problems with it, though. Um, number one, uh, we have Psalm 148, verse 4, says in a post-flood context, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be, at the time of David, above the heavens. There's still water up there, number one. But this is the bigger problem. When you look up the Hebrew there, you see the, in the red, it's Berukhiya, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. The point is there's a letter bait preceding the Hebrew word. I learned this much in Hebrew 101, taking it twice, that when a word is preceded with the prefix of bait, it means in, not outside and around, which is what the Kent Hove and Carl Baugh thesis requires. The earth surrounded in the firmament and the sun, moon, and stars outside of it. So I saw a video that Kent Hove did on the two firmaments, and he acknowledged that this is a problem, so he did a whole video talking about, well, the first one was destroyed, but there's one on the outside perimeter of the universe, whatever that means. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> book chapter verse on that, man. I can't prove this at all. Here's the Hovind theory. When God first made the earth, there was earth and space. Then in day two, he put a crystalline canopy above the atmosphere and where Adam and Eve lived and the birds fly maybe 10 miles up. Wild guess. And he must have put a second crystalline firmament beyond the stars. People 
nobody knows where the star, where does the universe end? And what's on the other side? I don't know. But it says, uh, the waters that be above the heavens. There are two, in answer to the, the legitimate criticism that the birds fly in the firmament and the stars are in the firmament, there may be two crystalline canopies and two firmaments. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he was caught up to the third heaven. Hoven theory would be the first heaven is the atmosphere that we're breathing up. Maybe it used to be maybe 10 miles thick and now it's expanded out to 50 or 60 miles. Who cares? It used to have a atmosphere, <clears throat> I'm going to pick a number and say 10 miles thick, a layer of ice, maybe three fingers thick like Josephus and the Jews taught, uh, you know, have always taught. Then stars with bazillions of stars in it going who knows how far, and then another crystalline firmament. And beyond that, I don't know. Uh, but Paul was caught up to the third heaven. So the first heaven would be where the birds fly, the second heaven where the stars are, and the third heaven where God lives best I can figure out. I love Ken Hoven. I consider him a brother. He is largely responsible for the problems I'm having right now because he came through my little Baptist church when I was in my late teens, early 20s, did his creation week-long seminar, Creation versus Evolution. I got his six VHS set. Remember VHS back in the day? It's like 12 hours of Ken Hoven creation stuff. I dubbed it all to audio cassette and would listen to it religiously in my car till I practically had it memorized and would teach it uh, myself. I loved all that stuff. And he's the one that taught me, he and others, that this is our source for truth. And of course, he's King James only. This is our source for truth, and we can take it literally. Okay, brother, that's what I'm trying to do. And we're running into problems with that idea of the firmament being an ice can canopy. If you take it literally, from Genesis to Revelation, the earth is consistently described by Holy Spirit-inspired authors as something like this where you basically end up with a fixed, not moving, spinning, or orbiting earth that is circular with edges, and it has corners, pillars, foundations, etc. And it's under a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars are placed on day four. Now, I created this model just trying to take the Bible literally. I'm going, okay, if I just read the text for what it says, and I didn't have any preconceived notions in my mind reading the text, what would I come up with? And that's what I came up with. Something set on foundations, circular, carved you know, in a circle, with a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed. And it seemed to fit all the descriptions that I could see, like uh, Isaiah 66, 1, et cetera. Um, and when I put this drawing out on the internet, somebody sent me this picture of a footstool, <laughs> and I'm going, oh, wow, that, that looked almost exactly like the depiction that I came up with just going through the, the various descriptions. Now, that's the inside of a bigger structure uh, as I put more descriptives to the model where I believe it's something along these lines, again, taking the scriptures literally, where there are other scriptures that talks about God walking on the circle of heaven. So I've got a circular platform over the dome, which would serve like as a footstool. His throne is up there uh, on the top. And down below is this thing that's circular with a dome set on pillars. Okay, let's go a little crazier here. What about Job 26.7? He stretches out the north over the empty space, space and uh, place and hangeth the earth on nothing. See? Aha! Job proves the earth is hanging in space. I've used that scripture myself numerous times. See? That proves it. The earth's hanging in space. Well, the problem is Job had a few things to say uh, even prior to Job 26. In Job 9.6, he acknowledges the pillars of the earth. Uh, we see in Job 38, where he's talking about the foundations and all that stuff and laying the foundation. Other authors in 1 Samuel, we see the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon the pillars. Huh. So could it be then that Job's not con contradicting himself or others, but there's another way of looking at this. I think Job is confirming that the earth is hanging on no thing. It is not hanging on or from anything. In other words, all through scriptures we see over and over and over again that it is set on pillars. So if I said to you, I am in want for nothing, you would understand, well, Rob doesn't need anything, right? Well, I think that's in the context of what Job himself has said in chapter 9 as well as in 38, as well as other scriptures, that he's saying the earth's not hanging on anything because all the authors are telling you it's set on pillars, it's on foundations. Now let's revisit what I started with, the three responses. Let's do a little checkup on you. What? <laughs> Are you out of your mind? I, I can see the progression. I, you know, I'm not oblivious to it. 
Go buy stock and tinfoil, dude. You're a stupid idiot. Okay, what did I say? Search and see if these things be true. Don't believe me. I'm just reading scripture to you up here. Remember? Prove and test all things. Keep doing it. Let's go. <laughs> How many of you have heard of this game, Whisper Down the Lane? Right? We've all heard it. We played it as a kid, right? Who is most likely to have the truth? The one closest or the one farthest away from the original source of information? All right. So if we imagine these six individuals here as 6,000 years of human history, the problem is when you go to the one closest to the uh, source material, all through the ancient world, they're depicting the, world, the earth like this. They are all doing it. Not just the Hebrews, the Sumerians, the Babylonians, even the Greeks until about 200 uh, BC or so, the Egyptians, all of them had this world view of the cosmos. Um, this is another graphic somebody did depicting the various verses, and these aren't even all the verses, um, but the various verses that support this idea or at least indicate this idea. Now, I produced a video some of you may have seen a while back called uh, Flat Earth, a Doctor in the Village Idiot. And I'm the village idiot in that story. And in that story, I was saying, okay, when I started doing this and posting videos and showing this stuff, of course, everybody thought I was an idiot, lost my mind, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So then I found a highly respected individual, Dr. Michael Heiser. Some of you may know him. He's a Semitic language expert. Uh, he's the go-to guy everybody usually goes to when they think I'm crazy. Skiba says this, what do you say? <laughs> um, but what was interesting is in his video, he does a whole 25 minute long presentation, it's about 20, 25 minutes or so, where he goes through the scriptures line by line and he starts and says, if we take the scriptures literally, this is what you end up with. And he's on staff at Logos Bible Software, which is staffed by a lot of very intelligent people with letters after their name. And they acknowledge in this very expensive software one of the premier software, uh, Bible study softwares that you can buy on the market today. They have this graphic right here, created by Logos Bible Software, showing that if you take a literal view of the scriptures, this was the Hebraic concept of the universe. So apparently, I've now earned the reputation as the Facebook village idiot these days, and probably YouTube as well, at least according to the internet talk show buzz. I've heard uh, some people tell me that they're mocking me on various radio talk shows and stuff like that, bringing my name up. And of course, the wildly active gossip mill is uh, chiming in as well. And um, I, I, about the time that I was becoming aware of how much my name is being drugged through the mud, I found an article written by Dr. Michael Heiser. It was written about three years ago. In the article, he wrote, uh, literal creationists are actually only selective literalists, or, as I would call them, inconsistent literalists. If one was truly consistent in interpreting the creation description of Genesis 1 at face value, along with other creation descriptions in both Testaments, you'd come out with a round, flat earth complete with solid dome over the earth and earth supported by pillars with Sheol underneath, etc. But creationists who claim the literal mantle don't do that since the results are clearly non-scientific. My view, this is Dr. Michael Heiser now, as readers know, is that we ought to simply let the text say what it says and let it be what it is. It was God's choice to prompt people living millennia ago to produce this thing we call the Bible. And so we dishonor it if we impose our own interpretive context on it. Our modern evangelical contexts are alien to the Bible. Frankly, any context other than the context in which the biblical writers were moved to write is foreign to the Bible. So who's the literalist now, he says. I've pointed out this inconsistency before for ex in, for example, my online lecture about Genesis and its pre-scientific cosmology. What Genesis describes is consistent with all other ancient Near Eastern creation models and shares the vocabulary and motifs of those other pre-scientific cosmologies. That's Dr. Michael Heiser. Now, if you want to get to know who this guy is, you can check him out on Logos.com. Go to Logos.com for Logos Bible Software. Logos.com forward slash academic forward slash bio forward slash Heiser. 
And uh, you'll see, he earned his Ph.D. in Hebrew Bible and Semitic Languages at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Before going to UW-Madison, Mike earned an M.A. in Ancient History from the University of Pennsylvania. Major fields were Ancient Israel and Egyptology, and another M.A. from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Hebrew Studies. He also attended Dallas Theological Seminary. Mike's undergraduate degree is from Bob Jones University, but he also attended Bible college for three years. Mike's dissertation was entitled The Divine Council in Late Canonical and Non-Canonical Second Temple Jewish Literature. The dissertation sought to discern the ancient Canaanite and Israelite roots of Jewish binitarian monotheism and the early church's high Christology. Because of his coursework, Mike can do translation work in roughly a dozen ancient languages, among them Biblical Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Egyptian, hieroglyphs, and Ugaritic cuneiform. He has also studied Akkadian and Sumerian independently. Okay, so, I mean, you can he's got more to that bio. I mean, there's like one, two, three, four more paragraphs you can read on the guy. He's a highly educated individual, okay? Um, he's a biblical scholar. He's a, uh, Semitic language expert with letters after his name. He's like the go-to guy for ancient Near Eastern languages and cultural contests that nearly everyone around here, uh, in the internet community, they all like to go run to this guy for validation of biblical Hebrew and Greek concepts. And yet, he has said exactly what I've been saying regarding the cosmology of the ancient world. Even though I've never consulted anything that he's ever written on this issue until just recently. But if you don't want to listen to the village idiot, then at least listen to Dr. Michael Heiser. And welcome back to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, otherwise known as the village idiot. Um, right before the break, I was talking about Dr. Michael Heiser. Super smart, brilliant guy who knows everything about the ancient Near East. He was saying exactly what I've been saying uh, regarding the biblical cosmology. And if you don't believe me, uh, I'm going to play some clips from uh, a online lecture that he has posted on Vimeo. It was dated September 29th, 2010. And he went through many, uh, if not the exact same scriptures that I went through in the previous broadcast where I was going through the the Bible, uh, showing you all the various verses that support a stationary, flat, enclosed earth under domes, set on pillars, etc. Right? So here is uh, some clips from his online lecture. The Old Testament shares terms and ideas with the ancient Near Eastern pagans. And we, we talked a little bit about this last week. This should not be a surprise because there are similarities between the conception of how the world that we experience was made that are shared with Israel's neighbors. We see these terms as metaphorical, the terms that I'm going to cover tonight. We, we look at them, you know, when the Old Testament says something like that the sky is supported by pillars. Oh, that's just metaphorical. It's just poetic. To us it is, and you know why? Because we have a scientific worldview. That's why. They didn't. They were serious. No ancient person ever scaled a mountain. Do you realize that? Like the tall mountains? Because it takes oxygen, they freeze. I mean, all this kind of special equipment. There's no record that any of them ever did it. Okay, until the fifth, it wasn't until the 15th century that we have you know, the whole issue resolved of can you sail this way and come out the other? You know, the, the whole idea about the earth being a globe and all that kind of stuff, that, that was debated up into the 15th, you know, 15th century. We look at that and go, oh, you know, it's just poetic. It is to us. But what I'm going to say is, again, back to my introduction, if you take it literally, you have to give them the benefit of the doubt. They were serious about it. All these concepts and even some of the terms are part of ancient Near Eastern cosmology. In other words, what I'll show you tonight, the division of the world, what the world looks like in Israelite cosmology, you'll, you can find the same descriptions anywhere else. Egypt, Mesopotamia, you know, ancient Syria, the Hittites, whatever. Because this was a common worldview. This is what it would look like. I didn't make this graphic, which is why it looks cool. Okay. 
Somebody gave this to me because they hated, honestly, at Western, uh, they, they hated the one I used, and so they gave me this. This is a three-tiered cosmology. There's God. We're going to see it in the verses. I'll show you that God lives above the vault of heaven, the firmament. And in the firmament, you have windows and doors. Then you have the earth. We're going to see verses that talk about the ends of the round, flat earth here. Underneath is Sheol. Sheol can be both the grave and it can also be the underworld. Okay? It's, it's not quite hell, but it's sort of like hell. We can talk a little bit about it. And then underneath that, we have the great deep. These are all scriptural terms that are on this map. This is what an Israelite, an, Egypt, an Egyptian would have had different terms, but the same three-tiered level same with the Mesopotamians. Now they have, theologically, they have dramatically different views of what's going on here. Not just who made it, but what's going on. Views of afterlife, the value of humanity. I mean, it's, it's dramatically different. And I've made the comment before, Genesis is about theological messaging. And there are some dramatic differences in what Israel is saying, the Bible is saying, and anything else. So let's take a look at the parts. Waters above and below the heavens. Genesis 1.6, God said, let there be an expanse. Some translations have firmament. It's rakiah in Hebrew. In the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, the rakiah, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And what was that expanse called? Heaven. The heavens, the sky, Shemayim in Hebrew. So you have here sky, okay, and you have waters above the sky, and of course you've got waters below down here, but then you have you know, the atmospheric heavens as well. Psalm 148 mentions the waters that are above the heavens. That's after the flood. Did you catch that? Because a lot of people want to say, oh, the water's above. They went away with the flood. See, the, 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 the firmament was this canopy thing, and it was there, and then the flood, it just went away. And no, it wasn't. According to the psalmist, it's, he's still referring to it. Proverbs 8, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. Isn't that interesting? We'll get to that circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above. Made firm is amatz in Hebrew. It is the same verb for letting a tree grow firm, hard. Ancient cosmology across the board believed that the sky was this dome over the earth and it was solid. Kind of like the Truman Show. Okay. They believed that the stars were affixed to it. Some of the stars never moved. But other ones did. And the ones that did, this is why the word stars is attributed to the sons of God and to angels in biblical literature. They believed that the stars were animate beings, that they were really divine beings, and then they'd come to earth as angels, but they, were, they lived up there. And those were the ones that moved. Why? Because movement shows what? If something moves, it's alive, okay? Again, they can't take a rocket and go up and check it out. They, they believe that this is they're, they're, there's a solid expanse over them. Another passage. Job 37, verse 18. Can you, like him, you know, speaking of Job, you know, drawing the dramatically poor comparison of God and Job, of course we know who's going to win there, but can you, like him, spread out the skies hard, kazakh, Hard as cast metal, mutsak, as a metal mirror. Mutsak is the same word used in the casting of the laver, you know, the tabernacle where they would wash. It's solid. It's also the same terminology used for flint rock. Again, these passages point to the belief that there's a dome, the sky is a dome, and it's solid. And God lives above it, we live below it. Job 22, did I skip one? Did I? No, I didn't. 
<clears throat> but you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Thick clouds veil him so that he does not see, and he walks on the vault of heaven. That's where God lives. It's his address. You know, and b before we, we think, oh, that's quaint. How cute. We think that, don't we? If a little child would ask you, where does God live? Up there. Is there something wrong with that answer? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Use it, you know. Uh, because there's the sense that God lives off planet. Why? Because he created the earth for us. He doesn't need it. He's independent of it. He transcends it. That's all it is. It's very normal. Amos 9, 6, he builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. The vault upon the earth. Who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out in the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. And Psalm 29, Lord sits enthroned over the flood. Again, I told you I'm going to be a flaming literalist tonight. I'm going to say that I'm going to take them absolutely at their word. Vault of the heavens, pillars and mountains. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. Oh, that's just metaphor and poetry. Yeah, to us it is. If you ask them, it's like, well, there's that, that, that big mountain thing. I mean, that's like, that's holding up the sky. Duh. If you don't believe it, go find I mean, <laughs> how are you going to find out any different? You know, obviously we can, but, you know, the means to do that isn't with them. 2 Samuel 28, the earth reeled and rocked, the foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because God was angry. Windows and doors, and that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. Psalm 78, yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. Again, familiar phrases. Pillars under the earth, supporting the earth. Again, look at the language. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. You betcha. It's not Marduk. It's not that silly Ta in Egypt. It's Yahweh who did that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, an Israelite would want you to marvel. You would think you're insane if you didn't. Either that or a pagan. Job 38.4, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. Again, think of the circle with the, with the earth in the middle. For his steadfast love endures forever. Now, that is a very brief overview of Old Testament cosmology. But the message I want you to take away again is Genesis is about theological messaging. And if we look at Genesis this way, it doesn't matter that Genesis is, and the rest of the Bible is littered with this kind of cosmological language because God didn't bother to change the culture. He could have if he wanted to. He didn't care. If he had cared, he would have done it. The only other conclusion is that he couldn't, and then you have a problem with omnipotence. Okay? God doesn't care. I'm coming to these people at this time, in this place. They're, it's second millennium B.C. They don't know it's B.C. yet because Jesus doesn't come. But it's a long time, okay, way, 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 way back. And I'm going to give them a message, and they're going to do the best they can under my influence to express it. I'm going to watch as they write. If they goof up, I'm going to send somebody along. Yeah, go fix that. You know, they didn't quite get it right. Somebody will come along and clean that up a little bit. When it gets done with the process, God can look at this thing we call the Bible and say, good job. It's pretty good. I'm satisfied with that. But all of that content is fixed in a particular worldview that we don't have. Okay, we have to let it be what it is. And let God, let God's decision to do it that way settle with us. And my challenge to you is try it. <laughs> okay, if you do that, you don't need to justify it to science. They need to justify why they're criticizing it for not being what it was never intended to be. 
And that would be an interesting conversation. Don't accept that the way they articulate the debate. All right. That's where I'll end that. So clearly, Dr. Michael Heiser fully acknowledges that the Bible absolutely argues in favor of a still flat circular earth with a dome over it. I mean, let that sink in, guys. Go read this guy's bio. A Semitic language expert acknowledges that the Hebrews had the same cosmology as the ancient Near East, which was just the same way it's depicted in the Logos Bible software picture. Now, all the stuff that I've been referring to in this broadcast so far came as a result of me trying to confirm that Logos actually made that picture because I've used that picture quite a bit. And, you know, people uh, get creative with Photoshop sometimes. So I wanted to make sure that, that was a legitimate image created by Logos Bible Software, which is a highly respected Bible tool software you know, program. So as I'm searching to confirm that that was, in fact, created by Logos Bible Software, I'm finding all these articles that I've been referring to in this broadcast so far. And then I found this video uh, of Michael Heiser saying that. Now, I said it, and people mocked me, and they dismissed it, and they stated that the whole biblical flat earth thing, you know, that was just a myth that, that showed up a couple hundred years ago to make Christians look stupid. No, guys. It was the dominant view of the ancient world. Face it. That's what it was until about 1,500 years ago. And this is confirmed, again, by a highly educated intellectual who's one of the big content contributors to Logos Bible Software. Okay, so again, if you don't want to believe me, the village idiot, then believe him. Now, that said, he, he, he was, you heard him in the previous session there say that Genesis is uh, about theological messaging. And he, he's basically making the case that the Bible is just there to give us theology, you know, how to understand our relationship with God. Well, hey, that's true. But the creator of the cosmos told several authors, and he read a bunch of them, and I put a whole bunch more in, in the stuff that I wrote long before I ever read any of his stuff. You know, he, the Holy Spirit inspired these guys to describe the earth a very specific way. You know, Mike says, well, you know, God never felt it, the need to correct them in their apparent uh, wrong interpretation or understanding. Well, wait a minute. Why would God have to correct them? He's the one that inspired them to write it in the first place. He'd have to correct himself. He's the one that told them to write it that way. This was the Hebraic concept of the universe, and they were not alone. Like I said, there are many, many other cultures that believe the same thing. So looking at our whisper down the line, we have the guys toward the source material saying, we are on a circular, still flat earth, set on pillars under a dome, within which are the sun, moon, and stars. We get to the end of the line where we are today, and I heard we live on a spinning heliocentric ball in an ever-expanding universe. Huh. <laughs>